Okay, so we will now proceed with the next presenter. He will present the topic, Digital Driving Growth. Our presenter is Nick David Faubert. May I put my notes on your, on your computer? Is that okay, sure. or beside it? I won't break it, I promise. <laughs> he is the head of Digital Enterprise Media Corporation, CEO, Third Space Consulting as well. He brings 20 years of media experience to Southeast Asia through the Third Space Consulting, a boutique Southeast Asia digital and interactive media consultancy committed to fostering talent, skills, and infrastructure for a thriving regional industry. Previously as Secretary and Executive Director of the Interactive Advertising Bureau in Singapore, he is one of the popular faces of the local industry. He looks after the interests of major local companies such as SPH and Media Corp, alongside international blue chip brands such as Yahoo, Microsoft, and Google. As a senior executive, Nick was head of sales for Yahoo UK and Ireland and vice president international for CBS Outdoor in Beijing. As COO at Active Digital, Nick played a leading role in the creation of 25 million Singapore dollars worth of Singapore digital advertising network industry. Through his work at Third Space Academy, C Southeast Asia's only dedicated digital media training company, Nick continues to develop the next generation of digital media specialists. He's a frequent and popular public speaker on digital media, sales strategy, and human resource development. So Nick, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, you may clap for him. Hurrah. Get him started. You're terribly kind. You'll get me in trouble, though. So I'm actually no longer at Third Space. But for those of you who remember me being here this time last year, I was at Third Space then. So it's a big change for me now. Um, when I was working at Third Space, our annual turnover was about $300,000. And, and now I find myself at Media Corp. And uh, the annual advertising investment that we're trying to look after is uh, just short of three quarters of a billion dollars. So we're really messing around with figures here. It actually reminds me somewhat of what I was talking about last time, and, and hopefully I can find something fresh to talk to you about this time. But I talked about the idea of the matrix. And if you remember, it was the, the blue pill or the red pill. Do we stay doing what we're doing now, or do we move forward to a shiny, bright, but altogether more risky future where we're really not quite sure what the outcome will be? So both for MediaCorp and for me, uh, we've taken the red pill here, and I think it represents an enormous challenge for us. I think one of the things we're thinking about at MediaCorp is that even though we can throw great numbers around, and you know, three quarters of a billion dollars is a, is a big lump of cash to chuck about, we're not actually one big corporation. We're probably Southeast Asia's largest collective of SMEs. Because, in fact, we have television companies in there, we have radio companies in there, we have newspapers, we have lots of digital assets. We've got about 30 digital assets. Uh, and a full range of other services, from events and, and, and clubs that we look after as well. So we have a wide range of responsibilities. I've actually only been there three weeks, so this is my first confession. But I'm hoping that what we've discovered in the last three weeks will be an asset for you uh, when you're thinking about what you're going to do in your next three years. And hopefully, I can explain why. The first thing that we've got is a massive problem. This was the first story that I read on my first day there at MediaCorp, which is referring uh, to an application that we put out there in the marketplace for eight days each. And oh, my Lord, the community was scathing. Good heavens, they say. It's a pointless copycat. And I'm like, crikey, there's blood, sweat, and tears went into this product. What is it that? we haven't delivered that people are looking for. And our commentator turns around and he says, it's a burple ripoff that has little innovation of its own. Good luck with competing in an already crowded space with hungry go where, burple, yelp, open eat, and even shope. And I think there's a little bit of irony about that, of course, because if you're looking at hungry go where, burple, yelp, open eat, and even shope, if you're telling me they're not copycats of things that they've seen in the UK or the US, then you really must be dreaming. But I think there's something else in there which says, what right do I, if these are our challenges, have to stand in front of you and talk about how we're going to drive digital growth for the next three years here in the, in the Philippines? But really, I don't think it's the challenges that we've had that prevent us from talking about digital growth. It's whether or not we can learn from those experiences and we can actually address exactly what the problems are. 
So we had to invest a lot of time and a lot of effort in the last three weeks really trying to break down what it is that we do. The majority of our work in media is a legacy of our fairly traditional past. We go about generating fantastic content uh, that attracts consumers. And then what we give to advertisers is access through our platforms to those consumers. So it's a fairly uh, mundane task in some respects. And actually, it makes us feel a bit kind of disempowered, a little kind of also ran. Because to be honest, if our only job is to hook in consumers and then blast them away with advertising, do you know who's really good at that? TV, radio, and press. And they've been doing it for years, 150 years. So in some respects, digital fades in comparison. If you're going to tell me that a 300 by 250 streaming video on the home page of, say, Yahoo, and of course I used to sell that as well, so I said great things about it. But if you're going to tell me that it compares with a cinema screen like this and a one minute brand experience with Nokia or with Canon or with Audi, clearly it doesn't compare. So if we're going to grow digital, we've really got to understand what it is that digital contributes to a client's needs, to an advertiser's needs, to the brand desire to reach out and communicate with customers and start thinking about how we deliver that. So today, I've had a look through what is an absolutely exceptional um, agenda, and of course tomorrow as well. What we're going to hear from is an awful lot of disciplined specialists. People are extraordinarily good. We've got a search uh, chat coming up in a second, but there's some great social media speakers. I know Thomas Crampton is speaking in a couple of hours' time. Some incredible speakers about their disciplines. But what we had to do at MediaCorp was try and gather together all of our SMEs, uh, all of our different disciplines and all our ideas, and try and hang them together in a framework that our advertisers, that our customers could understand. The biggest challenge we have is that we're a content company, right? The legacy of MediaCorp is six or seven fantastic television channels, Channel 5, Channel 8. 90% of our output is content that we create here locally. We've got Channel News Asia, a carousel, a terrific and effective news channel that very, very popular here across Southeast Asia. But it's our content, what our journalists uh, generate. And of course, we've got Today Newspaper, and those are our three flagship brands. In digital, with things like Toggle, what we're trying to do is explore technically uh, our capability to give people non-linear access to that content. But we still find ourselves asking, how do we fit into the digital ecosystem? I think Ruth made an incredibly good point that if you turn around and say, which are the five big players here in Southeast Asia? You've got Amazon, you've got Google, you've got Facebook. I forget what some of the other ones were, but what really stands out is that none of them generate content. They're technology platforms, they're facilitators. And I think that's absolutely fantastic. And to be honest, without that, we wouldn't have search. We wouldn't have the ability to chat with our friends, to build those tribes, those social events, which are so important to us. But I also kind of think to myself that if I wanted to go and see the Mona Lisa, and I rocked up at the Louvre next week, and there was a blank piece of wall, and somebody handed over me a paintbrush and said, there you go, make, paint it yourself, I'd be a little bit aggravated. I think likewise that if I turn around to my eclectic brunch of mates and I ask them, what's the best restaurant for me to visit tonight in Makati? I'll get a pretty good feedback on what are the places that I should consider and what are the places that I should visit. But if I turn around to them and say, what I'd like is a 25 uh, episode series of one hour police procedural based in Las Vegas, I think they'll be stuffed. So, one of the underlying messages here is that regardless of the popularity and the success of social media, and don't misunderstand me, social media is absolutely critical. If we stop sharing, it's because we stop caring. So it's important that we link our content with the social facility. But the most important thing is we have to give people something to share. And we have to work as a content company moving forward. So I feel a bit left out. And perhaps that's why, when we're being criticized, people who are experts in the entrepreneur business, that their focus is on technology builds. And their criticisms of what MediaCorp are delivering are based upon the fact that they don't really get content. Because what they do is build technology and expect everybody else to build the content. 
But it does mean that MediaCorp now, like you have all had to do in the past with digital, is actually lay out your stall and try and allow other people to understand what it is that we deliver. I have quite a good analogy for looking at the development of digital in Southeast Asia. And in some ways, it could be considered a bit of a criticism. But I like to think of it as a wake-up call, as a way to inspire us to turn around and ask, how do we hang our industry together? Do people know what I mean when I talk about a cargo, cargo cult? If I raise my hand in the air, does anybody else out there raise their hand and say, I know what a cargo cult is? OK, so a cargo cult is a fun idea. And it's not from very far from here. I first came across uh, cargo cults when I watched a television program in the UK about 10 years ago. Um, and it was about a tribe of uh, remote Papua New Guineans who were visiting uh, the UK for the first time. And of course, they were coming from uh, uh, a, a, a very rural background and putting themselves in a cosmopolitan international city like London. And the thing that I was really surprised by was that they appeared to worship Prince Philip. Uh, now, I don't know if you know, but Prince Philip is uh, Queen Elizabeth, our fair queen's consort. Uh, and um, given his uh, history of gaffes, he's not somebody that you would necessarily recognize uh, as being a godhead. However, for these guys, he is. And I was like, what on earth is going on there? And apparently, it's a facet of what's called a cargo cult. The cargo cult dates back about 80, 90 years, mainly to the Second World War. And across our region here, we suffered the ebbs and flows of huge armies moving forth across the region and laying waste uh, to our fair countries. For a lot of people out in the South Pacific, it was actually their first encounter with developed technologies. So their experience of warfare was loads of guys coming up dressed in green, uh, bringing boats and bringing aeroplanes. And of course, these guys would rock up with their crates of cargo. And in the spirit of winning hearts and minds, the guys would then hand over their cargo to the local guys to keep them happy. Uh, to make sure there was no trouble in the local islands. So the locals, unfamiliar with any of this technology, thought this came from the gods. It was coming down from big machines in the sky. They opened the doors, and stuff came out. Cargo came out. And what a genius result this was. For, so from zero to hero, these guys were suddenly the wealthiest they'd ever been. The challenge for them was, or the benefit, depending on how you look at it, was that, of course, five or six years later, the armies thankfully picked up their materiel and uh, disappeared off to whence they came to wreak their havoc elsewhere. Locally, it was a bit of a problem because when the armies left, so did the cargo. So from reaping the wealth and the benefits of these invaders, suddenly they were left with nothing. So what they did was they treated it in the only way they understood, which is this was some kind of religious experience. These cargoes were clearly a gift from God. And therefore, if we copy what we saw done, if we get involved in these rituals, if we build these temples, the cargo will return. And so that's what they did. And what you can see here is a photograph of a bamboo airplane mimicking the scout airplanes of the US forces uh, during the war. But they also built airports. Uh, they built conning towers. They built people with uh, coconut headphones and grass antennas, and they waited for the cargo to come. And of course, it never arrived, because what they'd done was they'd emulated the outside appearance of success, but they didn't have the underlying critical technologies and infrastructure to deliver that success. And sometimes I think what we've been guilty of in Southeast Asia, and possibly at MediaCorp as well, and what we need to address is we need to stop thinking so much about trying to copy what it looks like on the outside, trying to have ourselves an app, trying to have ourselves a search engine or an email system, and ask ourselves, what is the underlying infrastructure that we need to tie into that will actually deliver the results that we're looking for? So that's how we find ourselves now. And we've got to get a list of things to do. Uh, as much as we enjoy conferences because you get people like myself and Ruth and plenty of the people this afternoon hypothecating in grand ideas. When we go into the office tomorrow, you're going to have a to-do list. You're paid by your clients. 
which effectively is calculated down to the hour, and you need to be using your time in the most productive way you possibly can. So you need to sit down and stop thinking about grand ideas and start thinking about what exactly am I going to do today. And I've no doubt that this conference is really going to contribute to that. But it all comes down to setting your objectives. And that's a science, right? This is like evidence-based medicine. It's about setting a theory in advance, my objectives, what do I want to achieve, and then testing whether we delivered those or not. And that's the essence of performance marketing, is to turn around and not say, OK, what are we going to measure then, but to actually come out with a hypothesis. I think that if I reach these people who are doing this in this way, that this will be the outcome. And the measurement is secondary to the theory. What happens, I can guarantee, is that any result that you get won't be the one you hypothecated in the first place. What you then do is you tweak a variable. Say, OK, well, maybe I'll alter the websites I'm choosing. Maybe I'll alter the message. Maybe I'll alter the audience. Maybe I'll alter the timing. I'll do it at 7 p.m. at night instead of 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And that's where performance marketing starts to work. And it's all about setting those hypotheses, hy hypotheses, I suppose, testing them, and then changing your output. Of course, we're going to implement technologies. But good heavens, there's a load of technologies. You guys come across the, the loom escapes. These come from the US, and they're maps of industries, right? So you get loom escape of social media. And what it's got is 15,000 brands all down in little boxes. And the truth is, I haven't got a clue what any of these people do. I can work on a day-to-day -day basis with an understanding of about five. And I'm guessing that you're probably pretty similar to that. So that means we have to sift through what's out there and choose the technologies that are right for us. Process is all important in making sure we deliver those on time and on budget. But this all sounds a bit dull. It all sounds a wee bit Google Ad Network. It sounds like we're going to put our numbers in there, we're going to wait 30 seconds, and we'll look at the numbers coming out, and that's going to tell us what to do. But we will fail. The success of digital communications, the success of media over the last 150 years, comes down to our inspiration and to our innovation and the creative way in which we reach our goals. Every time I'm training people and speaking to people, they turn around and say, come on, Nick, tell us the one thing you're not telling us. You've got a list somewhere that if we follow that list, we'll get success. And you won't. Because the second that somebody else does what somebody else has done in the past, the consumer's seen it all before. So although I'm here and we're talking about performance marketing, if we fail to engage our innovation and our inspiration, we'll fail our consumers and we'll fail our clients. So in fact, being successful in performance marketing is about coupling that creative vision with the processes and the technologies that allow us to deliver it. And for us at MediaCorp, that's what we need to think about. That's what we need to do for you. Otherwise, our big cash pile, as attractive as it may be, will spiral downhill. The reality for us is that already 40% of consumer time is spent online, and I'm sure you know those figures anyway. They're in the Bible, right? Our challenge is that when you look at the total share of online activity in Singapore dedicated to MediaCorp sites, it's 2%. So there's no way that we can drive our business forward on the traditional model because we're losing viewers from TV and we're losing them from press, so we have to find a way of delivering in that digital environment. The way that we're going to do that is to leverage the ecosystem. And this, this is my bete noire. This is my hate moment. This is when my face clouds and the frown comes down and the person over the other side of the room goes, stop, I think you're pissing off Nick again. But we all get these briefs, right? Hand up if you've had a brief like this from a client, right? What do you want to do today? I'm the digital guy. I, I want you to build awareness amongst ABC One males 25 to 44. Or C1, C2 females aged 18 to 35, right? I want to build awareness. There's a kind of fragility in that. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a bathos, there's a, there's a reflection of our own failures. Because no chief executive in the world, I guarantee, is going to wake up tomorrow morning and say, do you know what I need to do today? I need to build awareness. <laughs> They're not going to do it, right? They're going to say, I need to sell products, I need to sell them profitably to the maximum number of people, or I'm fired. And my shareholders are going to be penniless, and they'll probably chase me down the streets with hammers, and that's going to be embarrassing. So that's really what they're thinking. When it comes down to, we like to build awareness amongst 
ABC1 males 25 to 44, that's marketing speak. That's because we can't actually do what our chief execs want us to do. So we've built an entire industry around persuading them that the result that they're looking for lies in listening to our jargon. Now I have a difficulty with this internally at MediaCorp because I can tell you that, as I already have, that our biggest properties are TV, press and radio. This is dream for us. What is TV, press and radio great at? Fantastic, inspirational, full audio-visual experiences that are so incredibly memorable that you'll get out there and change your behaviors and change your perceptions based upon that experience. We do numbers. We deliver fantastic content, incredibly expensive content that allows these kind of numbers that these guys are looking for to deliver. The tragedy is that when we're looking internally how we're going to do that in digital, it doesn't work so well because the experience isn't quite there. So we need to ask ourselves exactly what it is that we're going to do. So we're going to change our perspective. The next question I'm going to ask you is, hands up anybody who's heard the phrase or who knows of St. Elmo Lewis? Nobody. But you do all know it because it's a very famous way of tracking the customer journey. It starts with awareness, moves into interest, build their desire, and hopefully at the end of it, we get action, right? Awareness, interest, desire, action. St. Elmo Lewis. It's a bit like St. Elmo's fire, but you're not lost in the 80s like me, right? <laughs> it's over 100 years old, and it's based on a very broadcast sense of advertising. When this was created, advertising was posters or pamphlets. And really what advertising was doing was about building awareness. And all an advertiser really wanted to achieve was to get you into a retail environment. And once you were in that retail environment, the interest, desire, and action were all delivered by the retailer. That's why major international conglomerates go into retailers and they say, I want to sit down with your sales team, with the guys in your electronics shop, with the guys in your fragrance shop, your cosmetics shop, and I want to teach them about their product, our products. So when the customer comes in, they know what they're talking about. So all of that interest, desire, action was delivered in a retail. And all for 150 years, big media did TV, radio, press did, was build awareness. And boy, did they do it well. A fantastically effective industry. The challenge that we've got, and I'll take Singapore as an example, is that this year in Singapore, over 4 billion US dollars will be spent online. And that's people who will have experienced the awareness and the drive that takes place in television, but they will never have entered the retail environment that allows somebody else to provide the information they're looking for in terms of interest, desire, and creating an action. Because all of that has been transferred to the digital realm. So when I turn around and I ask MediaCorp, what are we doing in digital to make ourselves a success? What we need to start doing is stop thinking about driving awareness, because we have fantastic channels that do that, and start asking ourselves how we're delivering on the interest, the desire, and the action of the St. Elmo Lewis model. Now, the other thing I mentioned was that it's about 150 years old, right? Um, and so what happened is you built the awareness, you went to the retailer, you bought the product, you disappeared off, and that was the end of it. Nothing else happened. So that was the limit of their imagination. But in a modern, tied-up world, we've got other things to consider. How do we get people coming back for more? And how do we empower the consumer to get out there and be our best salespeople on our behalf? So the St. Elmo Lewis model is starting to fade when compared with the complexity of the modern world. And we need to start delivering on that side of our business. And down there somewhere, in places like advocacy, you can see the effectiveness of social media. But of course, social media is also very good at driving interest and desire, because if my mates are interested in something, so am I. So we can start to see that if we think of ourselves in the eyes of our client, the chief executive who woke up in the morning, who needs to track his consumer from cradle to grave, maybe the wrong analogy, then actually, <laughs> What we need to be doing is asking ourselves how digital fits within that framework and stop thinking about it as an alternative advertising medium to traditional, medium, to traditional media. The challenge is it's incredibly complicated, right? 
So we start sitting there and you're going to do it all this afternoon and you're going to go crazy in the head like I went crazy in the head and like people in the future will go crazy in the head. That really complex world that Lexi was talking about earlier and you'll be thinking, how on earth am I going to hang that together? And what I'm hoping is that some of the ideas that w we had at MediaCorp will kind of help us uh, do that. The first thing we did was kind of rewrite that customer journey in the modern world. And we said, okay, well, if what the consumer's doing is developing awareness, interest, desire, action, and loyalty, if that's what the consumer's doing, what does the marketer have to do? Well, in order to build awareness, we need to inspire. In order to satisfy interest, we need to inform. In order to build desire, to get involved in an exchange, and to take ourselves down to transaction, we have to engage people in a digital environment, which is break the ice, interact with them and transact. Breaking the ice is an incredibly important thing. I'm guessing quite a few people have seen um, that TV program on History Channel called American Pickers. It's a couple of crazy guys, I love them, I want to be them. Um, but they're, they're actually really nice guys, but they're incredibly clever. I, I do like the way that when they're driving around in the van, they've got like the, the, the self-help tapes on how to be a salesperson playing in the background. And they're there mimicking them and they're repeating them back and saying, I will be a success today. But one of the things that they do is they call it the icebreaker. So whenever they go in and see somebody in that garage for the first time, they choose something which really has or is very unlikely to have any emotional value to the person who owns it. And they offer over the odds for it. So they'll pick like an old bent piece of metal, an old hubcap from a car, and say, uh, you know, this is a very valuable thing. It's clearly not. It's a very valuable thing. I'll tell you what we could do. I'll give you 20 bucks for it. It's a no-brainer for the, for the guy who owns it. He's like, 20 bucks, sure, bang. There's the handshake goes down, and then there's the connection made. Once the connection is made, the transaction becomes easier. The ice is broken. And of course, that takes place in retailers in a traditional environment. We've got to start doing it in digital. So we have to think about how we, as content owners, can leverage our content to break the ice, to start that transaction. And we need to judge it as well, because we're into performance marketing here. And finally, we need to think about empowerment. What facilities are we offering within our content that enable our consumers to get out there as well? So that's what the marketer needs to do. Our question is, how then are we going to help it? Well, there's all sorts of things we can do, and you know, kind of thankfully, a lot of them are here at our disposal. The old model of build yourself a fantastic media and put everybody else out of business is kind of a little bit redundant. We have this fantastic opportunity to engage and facilitate with our co-conspirators in the advertising industry. Traditional media remains incredibly effective at things like t uh, inspiration. Why is traditional media so obsessed with getting GRP figures out there in the marketplace at the moment? It's because if they make the argument about GRP figures, they make people forget what it is that digital actually delivers. If we can just spend two years wasting time arguing about a technical measurement of my level of inspiration, I'll manage to divert the cause of digital. If anybody here gets brought, dragged into conversations about how we're calculating digital GRPs, my honest recommendation is tell them to sod off. We're not interested in your metrics because your metrics are designed to divert the conversation onto what you do as a medium. And that takes away from our strengths and our opportunities to deliver. We still have fantastic media in that inspiration side. We've got display. We've got search where we can catch people in the mood and give them links to information that may be relevant. Things like social media and mobile can all be used in inspirational ways. But the reality is that where digital comes into its fore is things like content creation and curation. And that's not just ours, but we have to contribute. It's also yours. It's also the great unwashed out there sharing their fears and their passions and their excitement and their joys. And we need to make that happen for them. And you can't measure that with GRPs. So GRPs is not an acceptable discussion in digital. We need to find ways to start a dialogue. And so for MediaCorp, we need to think about how we can help our clients break down those walls and start a dialogue. We need to think about how we exchange value. The first part in any relationship is to say hi. And you know, 
when we're out there and we're shaking hands tonight in our mixer, we're going to turn around and say, hi, I am Nick from MediaCorp. And do you know what we're doing? We're giving them as much as we want from them, which is their name and who they are as well. So we automatically engage in an exchange. But the same thing lies in digital media. If you want information from people, if you want them to join the warm circle of your love, your community, your gang, the me club for MediaCorp in our case, we have to give them something in exchange. It's not a question of incentives. It's not as brutal and shallow as a 10% discount. What a chance at winning an iPad. It's about showing them that being a member of our crew, of our tribe, delivers so many benefits moving forward that it's worth making that first move and saying hi to us too so we know who they are. Exchanging value is critical. Transaction is about creating incentives to do that. We need to think how we can contribute our content, our engagement, our enrichment, the excitement of our content to help drive that transaction. And of course, as an organization, we need to promote advocacy. In our Me Club, we've got almost 500,000 members. And I don't think there's many clubs out there, even the Reader's Digest, uh, who can claim 10% of their national population in their own club. And that's something we're doing really well, even if at the moment we're not doing it in digital. So that's what we've got to do. We're talking about performance today. So the nice thing is, I'm just not hypothecating here, I'm saying put numbers against every bit of that. Go into your clients and say, I'm going to track your client from A to B. And B is when they're a loyal customer who tells all of their friends about your business. And I'm going to measure every step. Sure, I want my Formula One car to win the race, but in order to do that, I have to measure how my rubber is performing, how my engine is performing, how my fuel consumption is performing, how my driver is performing. And we have measurements that we can do for that. So we've got things that we recognize from traditional media, brand awareness, attitudes, perceptions, intent, reach, frequency, that we can do to measure our delivery and inspiration. But we can also measure people's responses with things like search volumes, bounce rate, pages, time on site, retention. We can measure breaking the ice. We can measure whether we're good at doing what the American pickers do by saying, did they register? Did they sign up? Did they request information for us? And then, of course, we can make sure that we're delivering according to our profit goals with things like sales value, sales volumes, and sales margins as well. Advocacy and loyalty empowerment is about how long they stay with us, and that's where we're into great data there. That's where we're saying we want to sustain a relationship over years and start measuring things in terms of return on investment over customer lifetime value. I think the other thing that we try and think about as an organization is where the marketing money is going. So we tend to think about advertising as the only objective of us working here in the interactive digital and we chase down banner money and we chase down search or social money but we're still operating over that side of this donuts right on the other side where clients are investing an incredible amount of money is in things like assets development fees for technology platforms and marketing collateral out there in the earned media space it's about content creation curation dissemination and community management and when we look at MediaCorp and somebody whinges about our app, I'm like, you're so messing around with 1% of what we deliver to that entire marketing responsibility list. And we have to think within digital about how we're satisfying the need right the way through the business. So for our client then, if it's not about advertising, what is it about? So we came out with these five metrics. Uh, to be fair, you can find these metrics in many books around the world as well. We're not used to having our own ideas, and it's much easier to copy other people's too. So this is a great one here, and it's from Dave Chaffee. Dave Chaffee runs a, uh, uh, an, uh, uh, an insight and training organization over in the UK, and he actually writes a fantastic book. You should get yourself on, uh, on Amazon as well, right? So yeah, get on Amazon. You won't get it in a bookstore because they don't stock that kind of stuff, right? Um, but what they came out with these five, sell, serve, speak, save, and sizzle. So when you get that brief in there saying, well, what I want you to do is build awareness amongst ABC One males 25 to 44, just go, oh, shit, it's not on my list. Because that's not what digital does. 
When they turn around to you and do that, they say, stop. I'll tell you what we can do for you. We can sell your product. We can service your customers. We can speak and engage your customers in a dialogue, just like they do in shops, but we can control it for you. We can save you an awful lot of money on distribution costs, and we can add so much sizzle and sexiness uh, to your product. If I was doing this in the UK, that would say sexiness, but Singapore, right, so it's sizzle. So when I think about digital, I ask myself, what can digital deliver in terms of product development? And this is a weird one, right, as well, because it's like, you what? Well, say, no, I'm, you know, I'm a digital marketing firm, but actually I want you to help you design your television. And it's like, you know nothing about television. No, but what I know about is the guys who are going to buy your television. We can get out there and engage them in a conversation about what they want and how they want it, and it'll make your life a hell of a lot easier. And we've got companies that have been doing that incredibly well. We've got things like the um, Dell Storm, which actually turns around and says, you know what, we're bored of trying to guess what you want in a computer. Why don't you decide what you want in a computer, and then we'll make it according to your specification. That's digital involved in product creation, redefining the business. Of course, we're great in, in customer outreach. That's so is TV and so is press, but we can actually deliver sales. We can control fulfillment channels. We can look after warehouses like Amazon does. Uh, but also, of course, we can shift non-tangibles or electronic goods like tickets or like bank accounts and finance. We can distribute, and then, of course, we can service and get that dialogue going afterwards, all a hell of a lot cheaper than the way that you're doing it at the moment. How do we need to do that? We need to get ourselves a playbook. And what I try and do when I take that original brief is I turn around and try and fill in this grid. So again, another challenge for you guys, how many people have seen this grid before? Okay, now I'm surprised. I kind of thought that the Philippines was the startup nation of Southeast Asia. Is that right? Is it? Yeah? But you've never looked at the lean startup. So this is the lean startup canvas, and it basically says if you want to turn around and launch a company, don't turn around and say, what can I do? What is my technology? What am I going to foist upon the marketplace? Turn around and ask, what's the consumer's problem? It's a really interesting challenge to put in front of companies, because you know what they write in, what's the problem? They write in it, what's their problem? I can't reach enough customers. I need to change my product. And I'm like, I don't even know why you're there. Ask yourself what the consumer problem is. Now, this is a bit of a mind play, right? This is confusing. So imagine what the consumer problem is for a, uh, a camera maker. If you go and ask a camera maker what the consumer problem is, they'll say, oh, uh, we need a bigger pixel uh, camera uh, with a lens that does kind of telephoto and, and, and zoom as well as uh, widescreen. It's got to be light. It's got to fit in my pocket. But that wasn't the consumer problem for photography. For consumer photography, the problem is I want to share my life with my friends. The problem is I want to boast about what I've done. The problem is I want to demonstrate my social networking and the people I hang out with. That's the challenge that the consumer brings to the camera maker. And what the camera maker then confuses that with is what their own problems is, which is how to make a more complicated camera. But in fact, when you see companies or camera companies that have done an incredible job, um, uh, and actually Ruth's part of the big Dentsu network here, and Dentsu did a fantastic job with uh, Canon, what, they, what Canon do is not try and sell cameras. They try and sell memories. And they try and sell social engagement. And they try and sell fame. And they try and sell creativity and innovation. And that's a fantastically unusual way of looking at the business. The reason why it's really good way to look at things when we're working in digital is it starts to fill in the rest of the box. Because if you're trying to write an advertising campaign for a camera that thinks its problem is the size of its pixels or the, bigger, the size of its telephotos, you ain't got nothing to work with. But if you turn around and try and sell a camera on the base that we're sharing visions, sharing family life, our history, our ambitions, and our inspiration, boy, you're in a digital world here. Because once we've got those ideas there, we can start thinking about building platforms and delivering content that meet those goals. So when Ruth says the most important question is ask your client questions, or the most important thing is ask your client questions, 
These are the questions we're talking about asking here. Challenge your client in what it is they're genuinely trying to achieve. Everything else here falls in line. I look at what my consumer problem is, what's the existing solution? If I'm not differentiated, give up. Or find a way to differentiate yourself. Think about what your consumer solution is. Selling shoes doesn't have to be about making a good set of shoes. It can be about giving them a good set of shoes with 24-hour delivery. So you can actually change the entire business model in order to take advantage of the digital ecosystem and the digital infrastructure. You can build that into the product. And of course, talking about cameras again, many of them do. So now when you get a consumer camera these days, social media is already built in. You log in your Facebook, you take the snap, and it's up there on social media already. So people have changed the product to integrate digital. There's the product development side. And then, of course, on the other side, we've got our market development. So I'm feeling a bit like Miley Cyrus with this microphone here. We've all got to get Miley Cyrus in somewhere, right? On the other side, you've got the market development things. So we're talking about what our unique value proposition is. What is our unfair advantage? What is the things that other people cannot um, compete upon? What channels am I going to reach out for and how I'm going to deliver that? And in there, you can see some of the more traditional metrics. But I hope that you can see how changing the product in the first case will actually alter the way you approach your channels in the second case. Creating a practical solution, then, is about understanding those contexts and those technologies, understanding those opportunities and those goals. But more importantly, it's about creating simple, actionable plans that have the flexibility to deliver on the goals that people require. We've built ourselves a Bible. We call it a playbook, and it's got 90 to 95 steps that you can go through to go from zero to hero in digital, and it starts absolutely nowhere. But what I'm going to do very quickly, and I'm going to spin through these slides, but I know you can load them down, but what I really want you to see is how we structure that playbook, because if you copy it yourself, you might find a way of delivering those results that your clients are looking for with the performance metrics that you'll learn over the next two, two days. The first thing we do is we reverse engineer the journey. So we ask the client, what is your platform? And that's the first place you start. Not where are my banners, what is my platform? And what am I doing on that platform? And how will that deliver the solutions the client is looking for? We ask ourselves how we're building a CRM system in there. So imagine yourself going around the clock this way, right? So we're talking about getting CRM systems in there and saving data on what our customers are up to. If your client has a platform without CRM, what's the point? You can never build up that relationship. Down there at 4 o'clock, you've got content. At number 5 o'clock, you've got people out there saying, what am I going to reach out to in terms of channels? And don't forget, TV and press is a part of that. Finally, halfway through the process, we finally ask ourselves what we're going to do about things like search, about social, that chat thing about display advertising, the banners, about mobile, and of course, importantly, at the end, we look at things like evaluation. For our foundation strategy, then, we ask ourselves, how are we going to involve the customer in designing the product? How are we going to differentiate the product using digital media? And how are we going to reinvent the consumer proposition to take on board what digital does? So really think about that. You're no longer a marketing company. You are now a commercial infrastructure on which your client is going to hang their business. Yeah, very important. Customer relationship management. What are we putting in place there to understand the desires and values of our customers? How are we recording that and performing accordingly? What core resource are we creating? When we're designing our platforms, are we allowing the creatives to do it? Or are we allowing the customers to do it? So many bad websites are built because nerds like me, who don't have a creative bone in their body, program it. Yeah, that's not a customer experience. That's a nightmare. How are we going to get CRM assets in there? And how are we going to establish a community within this platform to enable our customers to love us? With content, how are we getting high value, relevant, transferable data, MediaCorp? How are we going to build awareness, interest, facilitate consideration, purchase and support, MediaCorp? 
That's what we're out there doing and how are we going to help people coordinate these activities in their organization? Because it doesn't have to be done by the content writer, it can be done by your in-company experts. There's a great uh, company I came across, again facilitated by Dentsu, that's twice I've mentioned them, but they built it for an engineering company and they didn't think you could do social networking with engineering because you can't put it on Facebook, right? But social media isn't Facebook, social media is a platform for people to chat. So what they built was a very simple bulletin board where the people who bought jet engines could speak to the people who made it. Boom! Incredible. Campaign planning, manage the customer experience. Remember that road, inspire, inform, engage, interact, transact. You're going down a road here. When you're campaign planning, don't media mix plan. Don't say, I want a little bit of TV and a little bit of press to reach that audience. Say, I'm going to follow the customer. And at every stage, I'm going to satisfy their needs. You didn't do that in TV. You didn't do it in press because they couldn't. Now we can. With search, do remember about search. And there's going to be some great guys speaking right now, and I'm running over about search. But do remember that search is kind of about one thing. In marketing perspective, it's about delivering qualified leads. So search isn't just about Google. You can expand it into areas like eBay, which enables you to find people who are looking for particular products and Amazon. But also you can extend it into any situation where people demonstrate an interest and an active desire to buy a, a product or service. And that includes contextual content on websites. So there are things that we can do there. Use CRM to measure effect effectiveness and make sure that we're talking about authority, credibility and relevance and recency to do that. And you can't get all of that without great content, MediaCorp. Social media. Effective social media means investing in resources, giving them something to talk about, MediaCorp. Planning for reactive and proactive social media activity. Using it as a distribution mechanism for customer information. Display, still about doing that woo thing, that wah thing. Getting the message across in a vast swathe of customer engagement, but always giving them the opportunity to turn that awareness into interest and desire. Work across media to deliver it and work independently for things like lead generation and impulse purchases, always against performance. Mobile marketing, it's a contextual environmental issue. What am I doing? What frame of mind am I in? I ain't going to be writing 300, page, 300 words articles and expecting people to read that on a mobile phone. And of course, at the end of it all, Performance, performance, performance. We are so used to being the guys who stand on the ivory tower and dictate what our consumer will respond. Stop it. Create the content according to your hypothesis, test it, and change your mind. Digital media is no place for the obstinate. We have to give up the things we are most attracted to. I have a terrible problem with that. When I write things down, I work really hard at writing them. So I'm writing an article and I'm like, shit, I worked hard at that sentence. And then I read the whole article and I look back at that sentence that I carved with all my ingenuity and, and intellect and I'm like, it doesn't fit. I've got to delete it. And I went through this phase of like taking out really good sentences that I'd written and then sticking them in like somewhere else so I could use them again at a later point. So now, now I've got like this entire Microsoft Word documents of 8,000 pages just full of random garbage. But I didn't want to delete them. But we have to do that in digital. We have to delete. So to finish, what's it about? Performance isn't about display advertising. It isn't about search. They're critical components of what we deliver. They are things that we measure. They are the tire speeds. They are the fuel consumption. They are the engine specification. But the thing that we really own is the customer journey. And what digital delivers to an advertiser, to a brand, to a client, is to help them deliver their product development, help them reach out to customers, help them to sell that product, distribute it, and service the customer afterwards. So I hope that's really useful for you guys today. And I hope I haven't bored you too much. Thank you very much for that, Nick. I'm glad to be on the consumer end of that. I was very overwhelmed by that talk. Lots of good information. If you can join me here, please. Sure. No need for a microphone, Miley Cyrus. You have one. <laughs>
Oh, please. No twerking today, please. I'm a mother of two girls. <laughs> okay, so that was very interesting. You know, you guys are here to learn from the best. I think that you should all formulate your questions. If there are any questions from the floor, now would be the time, please. Because I think we will be limiting this to two to three questions, because the next is a panel discussion after a speech. Any questions? I'm safe. I've scared everybody. No, yes, you have. You've scared me. <laughs> oh, Leia's, Leia's got one. I'm in trouble now. State your name and your company, please. Thank you very much. Um, hi, I'm Celine Key from TB TBWA. Um, actually, you presented a very complicated starting grid. Um, can you go through it? Because I'm not very familiar with most of them. Can sure. You go through them? Like, um, what is a high-level concept? Um, what do you mean by existing alternatives? Uh, kind of like, yeah, just do a okay. brief background. On that. I, think that's, I think that's really good. The, the idea that I presented isn't mine, because I'm a plagiarist of the worst kind. It, c it, comes, it comes from a book called The Lean Startup. And, you know, anybody who ever wants to get involved in working with clients should always go and have a look at the Lean Startup because it describes the thinking that a client goes through in order to bring, bring a product to market. So what it is is a very simple grid where you lay down um, what it is that you're, you're building upon in your business. So the first thing you say is, what is the consumer's problem? So the consumer's problem, I need to share my memories. Now, what are the existing solutions to that? Uh, well, it's an Instamatic camera and a photo album. Yeah. What's the solution that I'm going to propose? I'm going to propose an interactive website where you can take photos on a pocket camera and send those directly to social media and link that up with your friends. So that's the solution. You need to have a value proposition in that, which is how am I going to get paid? What, what bit of that would they pay for? Because if you don't get paid, you're stuffed. It's really quite interesting in, in uh, US uh, media investment circles at the moment where that's been a little bit lost. And what's going on a lot in the US at the moment is people saying, well, do you know what? We'll have a great idea and we'll think about monetizing it later. And I'm like, great, that. do that with your $200 million, not with mine. Um, so it's about what is the value proposition? How do we turn that into cash? Uh, and then finally, it's about saying, OK, what is, um, what is my unfair advantage? The unfair advantage is, what is the thing that nobody else can copy because only you can do it. Now, I, I don't want to spend time here going through it, besides which I'd, I'd, I'd probably distress a lot of people here <laughs> as well. But what it's there to show is that there is a different way of looking at business than taking a brief that says awareness amongst ABC1 males and actually saying, what am I trying to achieve with my business? So that gr grid is the lean, uh, lean Startup grid. And there's a lot of spin-off books from that that work alongside. Thank you very much. Next question, please. Yeah. Hi, Nick. Um, I know it's a bit, this sort of question is a bit unfair because uh, you've just been in Don't the worry. board for three weeks. But but uh, you know, in terms of selling, yeah. right, to the media agencies and from a client's perspective, when a media outfit comes and together with you know the traditional and offline, and you have two separate sales teams, yeah, right, and it really it's a translation, as you said, from what is broadcasted into an experience that's done online, and yet the selling is very different. Yeah, um, it is not done at a spoc level. Yeah. or it's not done on a convergent level. Yeah. I guess, you know, and then coming from that situation, then you say, um, while I tend to agree with you to some degree, mm. uh, depending on the content that's being served, that g GRP is the wrong way to look at it, but you have media um, planning, mm. looking at a metric, a yeah. singular metric, yeah. and really, you think, I mean, from, a, from what you've experienced today, what are the difficulties? Okay. I guess in facing clients, uh, or how do you bridge it? And do you think we have in the future potential of having a singular metric when yeah. it comes to, again, when you talk about earlier the, the talk of Ruth on transmedia, yeah. really looking at it as an experience, a progression of how you communicate the message yeah. in one metric instead of, it's just that the individual metric feeds into one measurement. Yeah. I think, I think that's a really good question. One of the things that I try and ask um, us all to do is, um, is to kind of take a step away from the traditional silos of our business and the way that we approach our business and what works for us as companies and to think really hard from a client perspective about what we're delivering. There is a role for digital on media schedules 
I feel the most prominent uh, uh, opportunity in digital to sit on media schedules is display banner advertising, right? Um, I think the thing that you notice is that even if you look at investment in digital advertising as opposed to marketing, is that display is only a small proportion of that, right? So only 20% of digital advertising spend is actually going on display media. So a fraction of, um, of our advertising opportunity would ever be discussed in that kind of media planner buyer environment, that traditional environment. I think when we're talking about digital as a marketing channel, though, we have a lot more that we need to discuss, and we need to think how we're creating the right platforms and disseminating, creating, curating, distributing the right content and engaging customers. I'm not sure that the right place for that very intense um, business discussion is a media planning department. I think there needs to be a different way of approaching business. And I think, you know, Ruth's kind of uh, uh, touched on that a little bit, which is to ask whether the structures and the approaches that we have at the moment, which suits buying television and suits buying um, radio or newspaper, is right for digital, because digital doesn't deliver numbers like that. It delivers business solutions. So I'm not convinced that it, it should really be in that area. If I look at companies that I think have done this well, I think I'd look at people like Viacom, right? So you've got all the Viacom separate channels. So TV's in there talking to TV buyers uh, and, and newspaper and radio doing their thing as well. But they have a fantastic outfit called Viacom Brand Solutions. And Viacom Brand Solutions' objective is to fit in with the commercial objectives of the client and from everything from product development right the way through to customer service at the end of that chain. Is there a place for digital in talking to media planner buyers? Yeah. Um, but you know what? It's not what we're best at. Digital is staggering, is stunning when it's part of the commercial process. Uh, and I, I think we need to kind of move away from that a bit. Thank you very much for that question. We'll take one more question from the floor. And I believe um, the second theater also can ask questions, yes? If there's anybody from the other room who'd like to ask any questions, please approach the closest micro microphone to you. They're stumped. Stumped. They're stumped. They're just tired of me, I think. <laughs> but you were talking a while ago about the to-do list from theory. Yeah. How do, you, how do you do that from something that's quite intangible into something that you really have to put into a list that you have to go by? Well, I, think, I think that was the biggest challenge that, that, that we had to face. You know, there's so much out there, you know, building apps, websites, creating content, doing a bit of social this, doing some banners that, getting my search terms right. And it, it's just impossible to kind of kind of work out how on earth you're going to structure that. And, and what we did, and, and I hope what came across today, is we stopped thinking about what our problem was and our organizational issues. And we started thinking about the customer journey. Because at the end of the day, the marketer's objective is to trace that journey from an unknown to being a loyal and, and committed um, customer. So by reversing that, we could like take ourselves right to the beginning. So now when we're, we're working with any client, the first place we start is the, is the lean startup grid. You know, I say, we're, I say we're like a collective of SMEs at MediaCorp, but I'd like to kind of think that we'd do our best work if we treated every client opportunity as if it were a startup and took that opportunity to really evaluate what the commercial prospects were and how we move forward from there. But once you've got that in place, you've actually, you've actually populated most of, the, uh, most of your digital media schedule. You now know what kind of platform you want. You know whether it's got to be socialized. You know what sort of content you've got to create. Once you know what the content is, it's fairly easy to select the routes to get that to market. So that's kind of social sorted out. Optimizing that to search, and uh, you know, search should be involved in that process to help, define us, help us define what content people are looking for, what terminology and words and phrases they use to do it. And for me, things like display are then a subset of that. What you're trying to do is look into what people are getting into and saying, okay, that's the catch there, that's the tag, that's the bait that's going to bring you in and, and, and help us start that conversation. So I just say, I've got to have a big list of things to do. So if I just go right back to the beginning and say, what is my strategy? Everything else falls into place. I don't find myself starting off with the beginning having a conversation like, should we have a mobile app? Well, you, you shouldn't even be there, right, at the beginning. You should be trying to work out what the business objectives are. Uh, and then it's, it'll be obvious whether you need an app or not, because it, it'll be whether the kind of customer proposition that you have is right to be delivered in a fast-moving, low attention span, localized environment, and not every product is. Okay, no more questions from the crowd? I think, Ms. Noor, we will move on to the next. I think we'll make you relax for a bit. You're Hurrah. a very 
interesting and exciting talk. Thank you very Thank you. much, Nick Faubert. A round of applause.